here? All right. Good evening. Welcome to uh, the third installment of Diversa TV. As in jazz and many other things, you make efforts, you rehearse, and you go with what you got. So if we go with what we got, I thought since it is the first show in February, and February is African American History Month, which expanded in the 60s from Negro History Week, which was an internal uh, celebration and remembrance of history, uh, I decided to follow that pattern and go with looking at Eugene African American history. Now, one of the things that I wanted to use in terms of a standard for the show is basically giving voice to folks or giving the mic or the camera to people who usually don't get it. And in this particular context, what I tried to do was uh, contact some African-American elders, a, list, a short list of uh, about 10 folks who were variously uh, recovering from illness, unable to make it tonight because of prior commitments, other things like that. So decided, OK, I'm an American griot. I will tell the story as it's been told to me. And so if you look at tonight's show, a sort of a historical overview to whose purpose is to illumine that which is hidden. So elders in the African-American community, uh, some of whom are with us, most of whom have crossed on and now are ancestors who guide us from the other world in our vernacular. So talk about elders in the African-American community who experienced firsthand what it was like and is like to be here. And uh, they generally don't get focused on until it's Black History Month, if then, and then, in the words of uh, one of those elders, then we're kind of forgotten, rushed under the rug. So... One of the things I want to talk about is black history is kind of like a cultural iceberg. And so I'll show you an image of an iceberg in a second. But the tip of the iceberg that most people can name is basically things like sports figures, actors, musicians, uh, popular cultural icons, uh, historical figures such as Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. They can talk about slavery. They can talk about historical events such as the Harlem Renaissance, slavery, black power. But if we look at uh, what's above the waterline in, of the, in terms of the iceberg, what you see or read in the mainstream white controlled press or in history books on occasion, and below the waterline is people's lived reality, including the hidden history of which there is a great deal in Eugene. So the history isn't always hidden. Sometimes it's in plain sight, but hidden by professional historians. So one of the things I've noticed here as a non-professional historian, but definitely a professional ethnic studies uh, scholar, is that uh, Eugene history seems to be one of those things that the, pro the professionals essentially ignore because they say, well, there's not a lot of it which we found there is a lot of it and certainly enough to talk about it. And there is some evidence that suggests that some of that history has been hidden to really kind of obscure some of the conditions. So, for example, being from Los Angeles, I know of how cities grow up. And the founding of Los Angeles was basically accomplished by 44 founding fathers, only three of whom were white. The rest were black Indians, uh, black Spaniards of African descent, and mixtures of that. So 44 founding fathers, three of whom were white. Nobody was passing laws to make the white folks leave. In fact, slavery was outlawed in Mexico and in California and Los Angeles as part of that whole liberation movement started in Mexico. In uh, Eugene, when I moved here in the early 80s, I would be technically called a newcomer in the, the, the parlance of some of the old-time residents who are descendants of what's referred to as the pioneer families. That is, the pioneer families that uh, came to Eugene in, uh, right after World War II. So they basically, Lily Parker Reynolds is basically a uh, daughter of one of those families, and she talks about you know the old school, the old guard, the pioneer family the middle passage, which is black folks that came in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 
than everybody else who came after the 90s. So I'm technically late Middle Passage newcomer in that parlance, and I and my partner, Sherry Turpin, uh, <coughs> created um, a uh, historic history of people of color called I2M Eugene, some of the slides that you see tonight. Uh, <coughs> if we look at the cultural iceberg, just to give you a visual of that, you know that an iceberg, a large chunk of ice, uh, very little of it appears above water. And above the water line, we'll talk about what happens in terms of Eugene black history. If you draw that iceberg, the tip of the iceberg is some historical figures, sports figures, famous U of O alumni, if anybody even talks about that. Other historical figures could include Moses Harris, Wiley Griffin, Sam Reynolds, Margaret Johnson, DeNorval Unthank. Um, some historical events could include pre-statehood, statehood, early pioneer Eugene, and I'm talking about the actual pioneer era in the late 19th century, the early Klan era Eugene, which is the 1920s, which a lot of people, that's part of the hidden history that a lot of professional historians really don't talk about uh, in terms of the Eugene history, Eugene being a hotbed of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, being run out of the University of Oregon. And so one of the things that we deal with in terms of having that history swept under the rug is what are the after effects? Because the reality is the Klan did not disappear as is reported in the mainstream press. Uh, such organizations don't just come and go like fads. It simply went underground. And we can definitely see that in some of the historical events that happen. For example, uh, well, we'll get to, get to that in a second here. So let's see. Go back to slide. Other historical events continuing on post-World War II, Tent City, Ferry Street, West 11th Negro Settlement, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Era. And when we talk about elders, there are a handful still alive. Uh, the Middle Passage, so-called 70s and 80s, and the newcomers of the 90s. Here's a test, above the waterline test. Can you name three streets named in Eugene after people of color? Okay, that's usually a good indicator. So, to slide, three. Moonlee Lane off of 19th in uh, East Eugene, named for Don Moon Lee, who was a U of O employee connected with student housing. Sam Reynolds Street, formerly named Sam R Street, and Martin Luther King Boulevard, of course. So if we look at, for example, this historical artifact, Sam R. Now, you look at this name, and this is, an, this is essentially Eugene Black History encapsulized. The story behind this, Sam was one of the pioneer so-called pioneer families, as if they'd come in on a wagon train, as it were. And uh, this sign was, after his death, this sign was, uh, a street was named in his honor in what was referred to by the Oregonian as the Negro Settlement, as if they came in on a wagon train and just settled outside of the city limits, rather than being forbidden as Americans from living inside the city limits, an arrangement which was perfectly legal in Eugene to discriminate, and which is why in Eugene you have no ethnic neighborhoods like you would in any other city of size. It was simply because people of color were not allowed to live within the city limits. And in fact, if you were a real estate agent and sold to a person of color, you could lose your license. Uh, banks could legally discriminate against you. And until 1965, when the federal laws making such practices illegal ended those practices, they continued. So Sam R. Street. Now, I work in alcohol and drug, and in the 12-step program, you maintain your anonymity, and uh, Sam R., you, you're usually referred to by an initial for the last name. Uh, Sam was not uh, overtly identified as being part of the 12-step community, so you got to wonder, as a number of people have wondered, 
why the name wasn't spelled out. Well, the family had supported the, the name, and they had assumed that it was going to be spelled out. And apparently, someone in the city of Eugene, in the sign shop department, decided that Sam did not deserve the honor because he was black, and they printed out this sign, which went up and remained up for 24 years. So having participated in the struggle to rename Centennial Boulevard as Martin Luther King Boulevard, and the political fallout that occurred after that, uh, I had made it, there had been at least two attempts by the family to change the name, and they were told by city officials that the name was too long, too many letters. There was al already a Reynolds Boulevard in an unincorporated rural area outside the city limits, and that the emergency services would be confused by the two. Uh, those are patently falsehoods, shall we say. The real reason is racism, discrimination. So essentially what happened is after a email battle and suggesting that it might be politically expedient for the city to find a way to waive the $500 fee to change two signs, the signs were quietly changed, and the, sand, the, the, name, the, sand, the signs now reflect the new name, which, oddly enough, fits on a sign like this, Sam Reynolds Street. So one of the things that blacks in um, Eugene have had to contend with is overt and covert forms of discrimination, but we find that this has been a pattern in the Oregon experience of African Americans. Uh, case in point, let's start with Moses Harris. Now, Moses Harris is referred to in the historical record. He was thought to have been born around 1800 in Union County, South Carolina. There's no real record. And it was believed by the historical record to be a freed slave. I refer to him as a black Indian. That is, it refers variously to three things. One. Blacks who escaped slavery and lived in Indian country, because that was what you had to do outside of you know, uh, what was considered civilization. Uh, blacks who were genetically related to native communities, who were descended from native communities. And or, thirdly, people who lived on the frontier and could be able to pass in and out of Indian communities and white society. And Moses was at least one of the latter. He smoke, spoke the uh, snake Indi Indian language very well. He was painted in the 1830s by Alfred Jacob Miller and Miller's observation of Harris. He was of wiry frame made up of bone and muscle with a face composed of tan, leather, and whipcord finished up with a peculiar blue-black tint as if gunpowder had been burnt into his face. In other words, he's dark. Now, if you look, it, basically... The, Mr. Harris is on the left in, wearing an animal skin cap and dressed in leggings of the frontiersman. He was a trapper, and then when trapping ran out, he guided wagon trains. This is another image of him, him, him on the right, and they're escaping from the Blackfoot. 1840, the declining fur trade meant the end of one career and the beginnings of another. He uh, guided immigrant trains into Oregon, one of the largest immigrant trains, which included uh, a wealthy black man, George Bush, no relation. Uh, Mr. Bush had married a white woman and was uh, denied access to Oregon because of his race. Uh, Michael T. Simmons, John Minto, Nathaniel Ford, and his family, and their black servants, Robin, Polly, and Mary Jane Holmes, who settled around what's now Corvallis. Now, Nathaniel Ford, had promised uh, Robin Holmes that once they arrived in Oregon, they'd be freed, because at that time, Oregon was being set up to be outside the slave uh, trade, uh, and we'll get into that in a second. But upon their arrival in Oregon, Robin was freed, but he had to buy his children to free them. Mr. Ford kind of went back on his word. Moses Harris eventually died... Uh, brought in a couple of other wagon trains, and his connection with the Eugene area 
is his connection with the Applegate family bringing in wagon trains over the southern Applegate cutoff. Um, and he basically lived in this area around what's now called Tualatin. So he passed through the Willamette Valley, never actually a real resident, but he's mentioned uh, in the historical record, and I thought that I would also give him props as one of the first black people to come into the Oregon Territory and the Eugene area. Now, one of the things that he, when you have someone like a Moses Harris, and you have, this basically proves the presence of other free black people in the country. And so if we look at how people looked at them, um, we get some interesting Civil War thought. If you go to slide, this is from the Salem Oregonian Statesman, August 4th, 1857. It basically, it is talking about the impending vote of the Constitution in Oregon and uh, the position on slavery. In arriving at this conclusion, we are not influenced by hostility to the institution of African slavery per se. We are of the opinion that in the sugar and cotton growing states, it is, necess it is necessary, if not indispensable, system of labor. We believe also that the African, whatever his nominal condition, is destined to be the servant and subordinate of the superior white race, and it is best for both races that the servitude and subordination should be regulated by law. And we believe also that the wisdom of man has not yet devised a system under which the Negro is as well off as he is under that of American slavery. Still, we think that our climate, soil, situation, population, etc., render it to any useful extent an impossible institution for Oregon. That is slavery. And so the reference is there to climate is that the southern states are warm, a lot like Africa, and Oregon, with its frequent rains and cold temperature, would, of course, exacerbate the Negro's alleged penchant for laziness. And so, therefore, since it's cold and rainy, we shouldn't be allowed in because we'll, we would just accelerate that and we wouldn't want to have that. So, in early November, this is a scholarly treatise, in early November 1857, the voters of Oregon approved the proposed state constitution by a decisive margin. At the same time, slavery was excluded, 7,721, 7 to 2,645, and free Negroes were prohibited from settling in Oregon, 8,640 to 1,081. The pro-slavery vote, compared to the amount of agitation that it emanated from the pro-slavery camp, made the whole affair seem like a tempest in a teapot. The electorate wanted none of the Negro race. Free Negroes were banned from Oregon by an even greater majority than slavery. So given that there were 200 black people in the state at the time that this Constitution was made, essentially what this Constitution did was eliminate slavery by basically banning black people from the state. This included black people who were already citizens of other states in the United States and did have voting rights. So in one sense, you look at in the, the values enshrined in the Oregon Constitution, 200 black people are banned and some have to leave, though the historical record only shows one Jacob Vanderpool who owned a saloon, casino, and hotel in Salem. He was arrested and deported under these laws, and the historical record shows that he was the only one, though I doubt that he was the only one. Yeah, it probably was about the money. Follow the money. So if we look at the language in the Oregon Constitution, white foreigners have the same rights as native-born whites in Oregon. That means they encouraged immigration of uh, white, white immigrants from Europe. And in the same constitution, no slavery or servitude unless as punishment for a conviction. This later becomes the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Article 1, Section 35 of the Oregon Constitution reads, No blacks not residing in the state at the time of this constitution can come, reside, buy property, make contracts, or sue in court. The legislature shall provide for the removal of all blacks from the state and punish those who bring, employ, or harbor them. 
Now, this was repealed in November of 1926, but this was the founding documents of the Oregon Constitution. Uh, further amendments, articles, blacks and Asians are not prevented to vote. No Chinaman, Negro, or mulatto shall have the right of suffrage, which is also repealed in the early 20s. And so we come to the phenomenon of what I refer to as invisible Eugenians. Now, the reason they're invisible is even though it's clearly illegal for them to be here under the laws of the Constitution, they're present. And the way that we pre know that they're present is above the waterline, that cultural iceberg, their presence is reported in the press of the time, like, for example, around emancipation, the end of the Civil War, 1865, uh, some um, Eugenian blacks were asked their opinion about emancipation and uh, their feeling and sentiment that they're generally for it, but the article doesn't mention their names. So they're here, but they're not even given the dignity of a name. So one of the first historical Eugenians that we hear about is Wiley Griffin. And so who's Wiley Griffin? Well, let's go to slide, and I'll show you. This is Wiley Griffin. Now, this picture was given, uh, Sherry found, uh, had talked to uh, Paul Headley, who was a longtime union organizer with LTD. In terms of the history of the local transit system, this was the earliest transit system. Now, the historical, refer re historical record refers to this arrangement of a mule pulling a trolley, and there are railroad tracks. So, for example, on University Avenue up from uh, Mac Court, you will still see these trolley tracks. That's Wiley Griffin. When West 11th was uh, being resurfaced and you saw some trolley tracks there going out, West 11th past the uh, chambers and all that, Wiley Griffin. So this was essentially the original uh, transit system, a mule or horse-drawn trolleys referred to as muleteers, though, of course, the union would like you to refer to them as tram operators. So, so here we have Wiley Griffin. And he was born in 1867 and died in 1913. He's buried in the Masonic Cemetery, uh, which is just south of the university campus. Uh, he is buried in an area where the, it was segregated. Only people of color were uh, buried there. Uh, and there was a marker, and I too am Eugene has raised funds for a historical marker to go on his grave and to be placed uh, in the near future. So Wiley Griffin is one of the earliest recorded African Americans in Eugene, muleteer. He made his home overlooking the mill race at what is now Eweb's employee parking lot. Those trolleys preceded the streetcars, vans, and buses that made up what eventually became LTD. The fare at the time was five cents, and children were described as saving their pennies to ride with Mr. Griffin, who would give them hard candy stories and sometimes a free ride home. He was also employed as a janitor for the University of Oregon dormitory, as well as the famous eating house in Meacham, Oregon. He was a waiter on the railroad dining cars and a porter at the Elks Club when he died. In fact, the Elks Club uh, made, uh, paid for his burial. He was described in his obituary as one of the most industrious colored men in Eugene, remembered for having a ready smile, a kind word, being a devout and devoted Christian, and a man who never drank or used profanity. Another obituary refers to him as uh, what a Southerner would call a good nigger. Now, having read that in, I believe it was the Daily Guard at the time, uh, which would later be owned by a Ku Klux Klansman, and that Klansman later bought the Morning Register, thereby creating the Register Guard, and then sold that newspaper to Alton Baker, and the Baker family still owns that. Well, the question could be asked, as I have asked and have yet to have it answered by the Register Guard, did Alton Baker 
who, who, first, who does a Klansman hire to work at his newspaper? Two, did Alton Baker fire the previous administration or employees or did he retain them? And then how would they report the news there afterwards? So this is one of those cultural above the waterline questions because you have to think about if the historical record is reflected in the newspaper or taught in classes at the university or anything like that, why is none of this really mentioned? How does it take a newcomer agitating to have a historical plaque put up at LTD and put up a marker in the Masonic Cemetery or what? Why does it take so long to acknowledge such folks? So if we look at Mr. Griffin, the, one of the most industrious uh, Negroes in Eugene, and given that it was, in fact, remember, illegal <laughs> for him to be in Eugene, working in a public place, prominent. We actually have seen this already, so we come to... The next slide sequence. And look at what is the cultural context. So, for example, between um, Wiley Griffin's time in the late 1800s and uh, just after the Constitution was passed, there was a poll tax, which gives us an indicator as to the fact that there are people of color still living in Eugene because, and Oregon in general because there's a poll tax, which simply means that you have to pay money to be able to vote. So this poll tax law passed in Oregon, remember, because people are still illegal, people of color are still illegal here in Oregon. Each and every Negro, Chinaman, Kanaka, and mulatto residing within the limits of the state shall pay an annual poll tax of $5 for the use of the county in which such Negro, can Chinaman, Kanaka, or mulatto shall reside. Penalty for failure to pay the tax resulted in forced labor for the state until the tax and the expenses of arrest and collection were discharged. So a Negro is actually an American black. Chinaman obviously refers to Chinese people of Chinese ancestry. A Kanaka is a Hawaiian. So when we talk about pre-Klan and pre-Klan cousins, we talk about the Knights of the Golden Circle. Now, I get into disputes with local professional historians who talk about Joseph Lane. So I'm just going to say that Joseph Lane, who Lane County, Lane Community College is named after, was not only an Indian fighter, but associated, shall we say, with the Knights of the Golden Circle. So what this means is using a strict historical construction Officially, he wasn't on the rolls, the membership rolls of the Knights of the Golden Circle, but his son-in-law was. So his son-in-law, who do you let your daughter marry? Now, the historian, when I raised that question, the historian, uh, one Doug Card said, well, his, his daughter was getting old, she was unattractive, she didn't have a lot of suitors calling on it, so he married her off to this guy who's a Knight of the Golden Circle. So, for example, the Knights of the Golden Circle. While many Oregonians did not want Oregon to be a slave state by forbidding Negroes, Chinamen, and mulattoes from coming here, Joseph Lane and his associates, or his associates, among others, were interested in creating a separate slave-owning state in southern Oregon, some named Jefferson, though there were other names for it as well, where Native Americans, Negroes, Hawaiians, and Chinese would be enslaved. That was part of the agenda of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Northern Oregon would remain free. Southern Oregon would be a slave state, basically starting about the uh, line about where Roseburg is, Douglas County. Uh, Southern Oregon still maintains a somewhat, shall we say, 19th century democratic, that is pro-slavery, anti-non-white focus if you will. Suggest, this suggests the idea that the, they could create a southern slave state in Oregon suggests that there are enough people to make such an enterprise worthwhile since Oregon did not have a fleet of slave ships to gather a potential slave workforce from Oregon 
from uh, Africa or China or even Hawaii, even though there was trade and commerce there. So we come to the real, true blue Ku Klux Klan, which if we talk about Klan terms, a grand dragon controls a state, grand cyclops controls a city, and a clavern is a local meeting. And uh, their book of uh, secret rituals is called the Chloran, which I haven't mentioned here, but it's the Chloran after the Koran. Well, one of the things that we uncovered uh, in the historical archives of uh, the University of Oregon was uh, you can, there is references to Frederick Dunn, uh, who was head of the Latin department. Many of the clan coins and collectibles are written in, Lance, in Latin and basically talking about America for Americans, true blood, red blooded Americanism, that is, you have to be able to prove as part of being a clan, uh, joining the Ku Klux Klan, that you have no immigrant blood, that your bloodlines are white, Anglo Saxon, Protestant. That is what is referred to as a red blooded American. Since all human beings have red blood, uh, what does that mean? No, it means racial purity. So anytime you hear that phrase, red-blooded American, that is basically one of the stock phrases of the Ku Klux Klan. And it's usually meant in that particular context. If we go to slide, here's a picture of uh, Frederick Dunn, head of the Latin department, photo courtesy of the University of Oregon Special Collections. Mr. Dunn, head of the Latin department, was the exalted cyclops of Eugene clan number three. You will not find this fact anywhere on the U of O website. Nowhere. In fact, if you Google on, from the University of Oregon's website, Google on Eugene clan number three, you will find no reference to it at all. You will find references to the clan in Tillamook, but no clan in Eugene. Hmm. So, Klan's offices were in the Beckwith Building, which is a building on uh, Willamette Street, which no longer physically exists. It's the Rock and Rodeo now, but they are listed in the phone book, Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> at, you know, on the address in Willamette Street. The secretary of the Klan was Michael J. Thompson, who, and a member and U of O coach, uh, who also played Uncle Tom in Very Little Theater's production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, C.A. Shy Huntington, who also bought, brought the first black quarterback and back running back to the Ducks while he was a Klansman. Here's the Beckwith Building, circa 1909, looking e southeast on Willamette, Beckwith Building, uh, on the uh, left in the picture and right next to it, the Register Guard. Now, the Register Guard later moved a few blocks down on Willamette, but uh, part of their membership was a Klansman. So if we look at Frederick Dunn, the U of O did not have a separate clav student clavern, but it did have Cyclops Dunn, football coach Shy Huntington, a few faculty members, graduate manager, several alumni, Clan members with businesses that catered to students, half a dozen students, including Maurice Wilcox, who wrote a paper strongly supporting Klan Americanism. The history of the history of the Klan, in terms of the above the waterline cultural iceberg, the Morning Register reports Klan organizing in Eugene. Eighty men have joined in 1921. It offers no list, and nearly 150. Man, Klansmen of Klan number three, identifiable in 1992. 60% engaged in middle class occupations. 10% are semi skilled or skilled. 80% were married. The majority living in exclusive or stable neighborhoods. Read South Hills. So the, the Klan, even though there weren't that many black people, uh, essentially was for 100% Americanism. That means anti-Catholic, and that included removal of Catholics from public office and public schools. Uh, the official record basically talks about how the fact that two Klansmen, uh, one of them named Patterson, hope he's not named for the street, but in case he is, 
basically successfully had two Catholic teachers removed from the Eugene School District. And the Klan managed to, in addition to electing a Klan-friendly governor, passed a law that religious garb cannot be worn in public schools. This was aimed pretty much at Catholics. Locally, they opposed Mercy Hospital, which is later came to be known as Sacred Heart, and the Newman Center at the University of Oregon. Klan members included, at the time, just to give you an idea that these are not ignorant rednecks. These are people who are, have prominent connections in society. All right? County commissioner, two city officials, including the city attorney and the city recorder, a local National Guard commander, the rector of the Episcopal Church, St. Mary's, I believe it was, newspaper publisher, a dentist, a surgeon, new officers elected by the Chamber of Commerce and the Elks Club. Elks Club was basically thoroughly Ku Kluxed, wrote a, a, part, a newspaper in Salem, which actually published the Klan membership list. So to put some of those names in context, Frederick Dunn, Dunn the former Dunn School, Ben Doris of the fam Doris Ranch family. Joseph Shelton was a publisher of the Eugene Daily Guard, the Democratic newspaper, since Democrats were pro historically pro-slavery and segregationist. Joseph Turnbill, the Elks Club se secretary, historically the Elks and the Klan, and Eugene have ver been very much linked together. This is uh, Shelton Turnbull Printing, which still exists, but is no longer owned by anybody in the family, uh, though the name still persists. So Walter Pierce was a Democratic governor endorsed by the Klan. Casper K. Kubley, who was mentioned in the story of Eugene, but in the story of Eugene, that book written by three of the white Eugene pioneer families, uh, two of the three of the daughters there, they mentioned Casper K. Kubley, but not his Klan connection. He was given an honorary membership in the Klan because of his initials, KKK. And the the Klan started initially with two riders galloping down Willamette Street to a parade down Willamette Street and initiation in the, in the fairgrounds with fireworks, cross burnings on Skinner's Butte. Uh, the cross that was removed on Skinner's Butte was actually the site of Klan burnings and it was basically used to intimidate the uh, black community as it existed uh, over at uh, across the Ferry Street Bridge because it was visible from there. In fact, a number of pioneer black families talked about uh, how the Klan would actually burn crosses on the hill uh, every Friday. And uh, this fact is not reported in the Register Guard and is as if that history didn't exist, except in the memory of the people who witnessed it. So if we look at the fact that at the fairgrounds there were 400 members in attendance, cross burning at the fairgrounds, so officially the Klan died somewhere after this. But we have had Klan, uh, evidence of Klan meetings occurring well into the 70s here in Eugene. Uh, the fact that every uh, African American oriented event at the Hult Center during the 80s received bomb threats including a famine relief benefit as well as Martin Luther King ceremonies, uh, celebrations, uh, including uh, the second to latest MLK celebration, which had a bomb threat phoned in, turned out to be somebody's dirty socks in a shoebox. Uh, Northwest Christian College, the first time it was held there the year before this re recent year. So there are Klan sentiments still in evidence here. Uh, the Eugene Register Guard then made reference to the fact that, oh, Ku Klux Klan had an influential presence in Eugene. Uh, you can't really see them in this picture, but it basically does show the two, um, the black running back and the black quarterback uh, that was recruited by Shy Huntington. Uh, they're sitting in the foreground, though it's difficult to see them uh, in this particular picture, but they are there. So... The Klan membership lists have never been published in the papers in Eugene to this day, even though it's been reported that the Klan died out in 1924. So the fact that it hasn't been published in any Eugene publication at all to this day should be indicators of something. In 1937, the Klan claimed 16,000 members, 
statewide, according to the Oregonian, wanted Eugene for its state headquarters again. They decided they were going to recruit in law enforcement and again be politically active. And again, local black community members recall crosses being burnt on Skinner's Butte and uh, have said that the Klan has been organizing well into the 70s visibly and invisibly, probably to this day. It's not too far off to speculate. So if I'm going to skip the Klan list because this is Black History Month and we really should talk about local black history. So the Klan is part of local black history in terms of conditions. So Ferry Street, also known as Tent City, uh, the man pictured here is Paul Robeson, who is a singer, civil rights activist, graduate of Columbia Law School, uh, an international civil rights activist, friend of Albert Einstein, who um, basically had an anti-lynching petition that went to President Truman that Truman refused to receive. Um, he actually came to Eugene and sang at the Ferry Street Chapel. And so just to give you a context of what Ferry Street is, go to a uh, slide. The Sandells were a white family who were instrumental in bringing Paul Robeson to Tent City to sing within Tent City. Sandells were also uh, influential in having uh, Pastor Shankel get into his first house within the city of Eugene, too. So Tent City was the community outside the city limits where for close to a century, transients had lived outside the city limits. It's now where uh, Lithia Nissan is now, and that was all unincorporated areas, uh, part of uh, Alton Baker Park, the, the newly created Alton Baker Park. So it was home to a thriving African-American community, although Tent City wasn't strictly African-American. People of color were not allowed to live within the city limits of Eugene unless a white person sold a house to you, like the Mims house, for example. So in his only Eugene appearance, Paul Robeson sang in the Ferry Street Chapel. So just to give you a map of Eugene in the city limits circa World War II, that in, in black is the outline of the city limits. So one of the things you'll notice is when we were basically fighting to create old, old uh, uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, people were citing that, oh, well, it has historical significance because it's centennial, but it wasn't always centennial. It was referred to as Old Patterson Road, and this is the map from the U of O archives that shows that. So you have to wonder, did the Patterson family willingly give up that name for centennial? And the history of it is only like a couple of decades old, so why not name it after civil rights? Uh, figure because if old Patterson, I wonder if Patterson was the Klansman that fought to have the two Catholic teachers out ousted, and if he is in fact named for that, I think renaming the street in for in favor of a civil rights figure would be uh, indicative of changing social climate, shall we say? Tent City, then go to slide. Tent City is below that. Uh, the uh, borders of the Willamette River, basically following the city, if you can see that, flowing in and out. The old Skinner Butte Cross site, Masonic Cemetery. Now, Lane Community College's Black Student Union started a commemoration, and which may or may not happen this year, but in past years, they wanted to do a tent city reenactment, and that is just like there are Civil War reenactments, both sides, they wanted to do a reenactment of Tent City, which many old timers remember as a time when there was a geographical black community. So one of the things in terms of, if you, let's go to slide to show this, Ferry Street, Chapel, what that is, a group of black pioneers in their church, and their church is an army tent built on a wooden foundation uh, with wooden walls. And this is a 20 by 40 foot army tent. And this is because they're not allowed to worship within the city limits with other churches, nor are they allowed to work. So within this particular uh, area, uh, 
water is supplied by hoses. There's no electricity. There's no sewer. Nothing like that. This uh, Ferry Street Chapel became St. Mark's uh, colored method or Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, CME, used to mean colored. They renamed it as Christian, and it's out on Sam Reynolds Street, uh, as I talked about earlier in the broadcast. So, St. Mark's. Because there were sundown laws in Eugene, that is, people of color were subject to arrest after dark, Eugene law specified vagrancy without specifying race. Vanita and Springfield, in fact, did spell it out by race in their laws. Sundown laws. Residents of Ferry Street could work in town but cross the river to live and play. Water supplied by garden hose, no other utilities. In addition to the chapel that was pictured, there was also a juke joint, a nightclub. And eventually, when the bridge across uh, the river was upgraded, Ferry Street Tent City was bulldozed. Now, of course, uh, since it was still perfectly legal to discriminate, no housing was made available to Tent City re residents, even if they could afford to buy a house or rent a house. So what happened was the West 11th and Glenwood communities, uh, which were outside of the city limits of Eugene, were places where people went to live. So even if you did have money, as Sam Reynolds and others did, generally white people wouldn't sell a rent to you. Realtors could lose their license, as I said before. And even going through a white media intermediary, as the Reynolds did, they were still refused when they attempted to move in. Willie Mim's father worked for a Jewish man who ran the Osborne Hotel, and he bought the house on High Street, which is now part of the National Historical Commemoration, uh, and sold it to Willie's father. Now, the interesting thing, as soon as the family moved in, they uh, were picketed. Uh, so Upper High Street, they were picketed by their neighbors who wanted them to move out, but since the transaction was legal, nothing could happen. So what happened with the house uh, on, on Ferry Street, on uh, yeah, upper, upper High Street, the Mims house, the family lived in the house in the back and the greenhouse in the foreground. Uh, I don't have a picture here, but if you walk and you see that house, that was used as a boarding house. So U of O residents or U of O students, such as De Norville Unthank and others, uh, Emmett Miller, Emmett Williams, uh, who was one of the first black deans at the U of O, and others who couldn't live on campus, lived in the Mims house. So the Mims house became a boarding house for black U of O students and black entertainers like Ella Fitzgerald, who, of course, could not stay in the Eugene Hotel because of legal segregation. And this is some of the uh, land covenants, the legal, the land covenant establishing redlining real estate apartheid in Lane County. These were legal until federal laws made them illegal in 1965. So, for example, this is fairly common. No persons other than those of the Caucasian race shall own, use, lease, or occupy any portion of said premises, providing this restriction shall not prevent occupancy by servants of a different race employed by the owner. So you couldn't own property, and it was legal to discriminate against you. So as no housing could be found within the city limits, except for rare instances like the Mims House, most 10 city residents lived outside the city limits. So West 11th, the so-called Negro settlement, was outside the city limits. Sam Reynolds uh, was able to buy the parcels of land on which now resides the church for $3,600, even though it was valued at $1,200. So $3,600 for parcels of land with no running water, no electricity. And this is basically documented in the Oregonian and referred to as the Negro Settlement. Tuesday Forum, big event for no local Negro families. So what had happened along the Amazon? It flooded. People's plight, the way they were living, was basically brought up. The forum that is referring to was time for Lincoln's birthday, which was then celebrated separately uh, from Washington's birthday before President's Day. Lincoln's birthday, because Lincoln freed the slaves. And so the anniversary could be a convenient peg, as we say in the media, for bringing attention to the Negro's plight. The reporter 
in this article, Stage Sam Reynolds' Dialogue Regarding Lincoln. He is being pictured here in this newspaper, smoking a cigar and holding a picture of a book with a picture of Lincoln's name, Lincoln's visage on it, and it's basically the caption says, Yes, sir, Mr. A was quite a man. That turns out to have been a lie. <laughs> Lily Reynolds uh, reports that Sam only read them the Bible and never ever mentioned re referred to Lincoln in his life. So the Klansman orientation of the Register Guard is apparent here and even fabricating news. So we're at about two minutes, roughly. Roger that. Four, three, two, one. All right, so another picture, slide. Robert and Lois Reynolds. Since there was no water, brother and sister are carrying water in a milk can drawn from a gas station in town. So every day they and their families had to do this. So this is essentially their drinking, cooking, and bathing supplies. They had outhouses for sanitation. Okay, the Negro settlement. Now, West 11th and Bertelsen. This is from the Oregonian, which basically shows the conditions. This is the mighty Amazon and uh, mud flats after it flooded, the Negro settlement as it's referred to. The idea of a forum generated drilling a well, which came to nothing, drew attention to a black family that lived next to what is now Flicks and Picks. They moved into a house. A cross was burnt on their lawn. Bomb threats were made to their house. This was basically in the 50s. This basically sparked the civil rights movement in Eugene, which the black community organized itself to basically look at housing discrimination. So as things began loosening up, there was a curious practice that developed. So whenever four to 10 black families gathered to live within blocks of each other, urban renewal would strike and they'd be scattered. So this included the Ferry Street community, which was bulldozed, the Campbell Center, which was also a site of the black community, the Federal Building, which was also a site where the black community was, and all those were bulldozed, and urban renewal was a, basically a way to break up geographic black communities to keep them from organizing into effective civil rights movement. So there was, in fact, a civil rights movement in Eugene because, among other things, there was a Ku Klux Klan in Eugene, as well as Black Panthers and other features that we'll get to uh, in succeeding versions of this show. So uh, just to give you a historical context, um, of black history in Eugene that leads to some of the conditions of today. I hope to have some other community members who are newcomers and also elders in succeeding shows. Um, but just to give you a context so we have shared information and we can begin to move on from there. Um, this has been Diversity TV and my name is Mark Harris and go well. Stay well.